Well, if I made a video about five tips to improve the lifespan of a BMW 5 Series diesel engine, nobody would bat an eyelid. If I make one saying my top five tips to extend my EV battery life and the critics all come pouring out the woodwork, shouting from the rooftops, your yeah, battery's going to fail in two years. How are you going to afford a new one at 50 grand? Well, the simple fact is cars cost a lot of money, petrol, diesel, hybrid or EV. And we should not be doing things that knowingly damage them. The object with an ICE car or an EV is to have fun driving it, but just avoid as much as you can the things that would do more serious or more harm than normal. Quick example here, I was a salesman in an Alfa Romeo garage in the 70s selling, among other cars, the Alfetta GTV 2000. Remember it well. Uh, this was an out and out sports car, but very unusual because I had an engine in the front, gearbox in the back for perfect weight distribution. And this did mean that the gearbox took much longer to warm up. There was a warning not to use full power until it had reached optimum temperature, and there was a gearbox oil temperature gauge on the dash with green and red zones. Of course, you could race it, not saying we did, but a cold gearbox with cold thick oil is not best pleased if you try a 0 to 60 time. If I owned one, I would want to know about this so I could avoid doing any damage. And exactly the same applies to your battery. You're free to treat your battery exactly how you choose, but there are some things you should avoid and some things the battery really likes. I'm Dave, and these are my top five tips to extend your battery life. Well, starting number five, battery is the most expensive item in the EV and looked after. It could go on for 15, maybe 20 years. They're guaranteed for the first eight years. So let's start with the easiest tip of all. It's the one we all ignore. Read your manufacturer's handbook. It's installed normally on most cars in the main display. It will not cover all eventualities or answer all your questions, but it's a great starting point, a good snapshot of what you should do. Also, please read the wording carefully. Ideally, should be charged to 100% at least once a month. It's very different to you must charge it to 100% every time. I think Apple iPhone advice sums it up best. It says battery life is the amount of time your device runs before it needs to be recharged. Battery life span is the amount of time your battery lasts until it needs to be replaced. Maximize both. You'll get the most out of your Apple device, no matter which one you own. It's really simple. It does also state Apple batteries are designed to retain 80% capacity after a thousand cycles. EV batteries do far better than that because they've got active cooling and heating built in and a whopping big computer running a battery management system, carefully looking after it. But even if we take that iPhone thousand cycle figure, where a full cycle is going from fully flat to totally full and then back to flat again. In an average EV, 1,000 cycles would give you around 250,000 miles lifespan. <laughs> Hands up how many people keep their cars for 250,000 miles. Yeah, I thought so. Well, extending the life is likely to just take it from 250,000 to maybe near a 300, 400, even 500,000 miles before it exceeds its useful life as an EV battery. They do go on for many, many more cycles, but at reduced capacity, eventually making them unsuitable any longer to use in an EV. Look after it, but it's not something you should worry about. Number four different battery chemistries. Normally NMC, nickel, manganese, cobalt, or LFP, uh, lithium iron phosphate, react differently to how much you charge them. Note this tip is purely about how much, not how often or how fast. That's next. This tip applies equally to really slow street charges right up to 400 kilowatt ultra rapids. Both battery chemistries hate being fully charged and then left there for days or weeks before use. Think a fully charged uh, battery a bit like a fully blown up balloon. It's under amazing stress. Both chemistries love spending most of their time at about 50% state of charge in perfect balance and harmony. So a lesson here, lesson here for those that can charge at home, don't. 
Unless you're regularly traveling a great distance, you don't need a completely full battery every single day. If you only drive 10 or 15 miles a day, maybe charge once or twice a week. It's really simple. And you don't necessarily have to fill it right up each time. You never stopped at a garage on the way home to fill your petrol car every night, did you? No. Maybe top it up to about 70% and top it back up to this when it gets down to about 20%. That's kind. Obviously, if you're going on a long trip, top it up more. Now, for those that use public chargers, this is probably what you already do. Top it up once a week or so. But again, ask yourself, do you actually need 100% each time? Most people don't. Just instead, put in what you use in a typical week and still charge it once a week. It's much, much kinder on the battery. Number three. Now we get to how fast, and the tip number three here is most people don't have much of a choice. If you can charge at home, you probably will. You'll have a low power, two and a half, three, five kilowatts, seven kilowatt home charger. These are absolutely perfect, nice and slow and gentle, very kind. Many others cannot charge at home and always charge out on the road, and probably a number of them will use rapid or ultra rapid chargers rated up to 400 kilowatts. Studies from tens of thousands of Teslas taken over many years show that the difference is there, but minimal. That's mainly because of the BMS designed to protect your battery. And don't let that 400 kilowatt charger speed worry you either. Your car will only ever take just what it needs, not a single volt more or a single volt less. By the way, no EVs at present in the UK can accept anywhere near 400 kilowatts anyhow. Now your BMS battery management system will make sure that no matter what you plug into, it will never damage your battery. That's its one and only job. The difference is so minimal over 250,000 miles that I personally would never change which charger speed I use to better suit the battery lifespan. My own lifespan is far more important. If you need an ultra rapid charge to get you back on the road quickly, go for it and don't worry. Now we're down to number two. If we think back to that Alfetta GT, 2000 GTV, uh, this one is important. This is battery temperature. A battery is simply a collection of chemicals that react with each other, where electricity is either stored or produced. That's it. And if you've done any chemistry back in your distance school days, you've learned that all reactions proceed faster and more efficiently if they're nice and warm. The battery is exactly the same. Nice and warm, nice and kind. But if it stood outside overnight at minus 14, it will not be nice and warm. Likewise, if you've been belting down the motorway at 70 mile an hour, although it will try to get warm, that minus 14 freezing cold airflow across the battery under the car will ensure it stays freezing cold. And trying to charge it is a potential risk area. It will not like it. That is why EVs are equipped with battery heaters and coolers. Coolers obviously just stop it getting too hot. Jumping in the freezing cold EV and setting off with a floored accelerator will do it no good. It's not kind. That is why you have battery preconditioners. Older EVs, some more very budget models may not have these on certain models. So if you're setting off at 8am on a freezing cold morning where your EV has been left outside all night, that's not kind. Then it will be very reluctant to even work, let alone drive you anywhere quickly. Back to that fantastic BMS. If it cannot give you full power without damaging the battery, it won't. That's nice and kind. It may only offer you reduced power, but very kindly then turns on the battery heaters automatically until it is warm and then it allows you full power. But preconditioning, if you have it, bypasses all of that. You can tell your EV to start heating by, let's say, 7am, so that your battery is ready by 8am, nice and toasty. And pretty much all EVs allow you to warm up the cabin at the same time before you get in. But as a bonus, if you can charge at home, or if you're plugged in elsewhere overnight, the heaters will operate off the charger supply, not your battery. It just means that when you arrive to drive to work or the shops, the car and the battery will be nice and warm, and you'll not use, need to use any of its capacity to turn on the heaters, because that will hammer your range. 
Now that's a great at home or parked uh, up, but what about at a public charger? Okay, the preconditioning function is also essential here. Most EVs will allow you to precondition on the way to the charger, operated either manually or automatically. When you arrive, the battery's nice and toasty, ready to charge at the best possible speed. Now there are some, many, who never use this, claiming, well, it's just going to drain your battery. No, they're mistaken. First, the power required is not huge, it's minimal. It will not take more than a couple of kilowatt hours at the worst, and you've probably got more than enough to spare. But second, if the BMS needs those battery heaters, it will turn them on when you arrive anyway. Arrive with a stone cold battery, those heaters will come on, run by the charger um, instantly as soon as you plug in. I got many photos of my heaters being on while charging. While charging. This means you have a choice of arriving with a nice warm battery, charging quickly, being kind to your battery and on your way, or arriving with a battery stone cold and then having to wait around until the, you know, the public chargers heat it up enough to get you up to full charging speed. The heaters work either way. You pay either way. Now, the only time I'd not use them is if I had a very low state of charge and needed every mile to get to the charger. There, I would uh, rather arrive with a stone cold battery and wait at the charger while it warms up, rather than have a nice warm toasty battery, but be stuck on the hard shoulder eight miles short. By the way, you should not get that low on state of charge. That's not good for the battery either, although once in a while, it might be essential. Your battery is quite capable, going down to 0% and up to 100%. And you can use it if it's necessary. It's just not kind to the battery. Okay, tip number one. Run your battery down to about 2 or 3% occasionally, and then charge it back up to 100% and hold it there for a short while whatever your battery chemistry. <laughs> well, this last one is one of the most understood facts about EV batteries. They read that LFP batteries need to be charged to 100% every single time you charge, and that is simply not true. Well, almost, I'll come to that. As I said earlier, LFP batteries can be charged to 100%, as can NMC, but the LFP handle it better. It's not so harsh, but neither of them like it, particularly if you hold them there for any length of time without using it. Where the confusion comes in is twofold. First, the LFP, because of the way they're measured, they have great difficulty knowing when the whole battery, which might contain 4,000 cells, is full, every single one. Over time, that drifts. We're talking weeks here. And so what it does is play safe and gives you the lowest range reading. But it's only a guess. And the longer you have it, the worse it gets. It becomes a guessing. So the best way to get it back on track is just to charge it up to 100%, hold it there for a short while before setting off. This allows all the thousands of cells to reach their absolute maximum. And the BNF, BMS now knows exactly the absolute maximum very accurately. Unfortunately, to ensure that EV drivers do this, some manufacturers who have limited space in the manual and they're dealing with drivers with very limited understanding of this process have taken to just telling drivers, ah, oh, just charge to 100% every time. One sentence is really easy for them and all EV drivers can understand this. Unfortunately, it does mean that for those who can charge at home, they will plug in every night and top up the day's six and a mile commute. And I hope you remember what I said about earlier about topping up 10 miles every night at home. It's not kind in the slightest. Your battery is permanently at a fully charged state, fully stressed, and that really is not kind, but it can cope. Likely will cope until long after you replace it with a newer model. The reason they state this is because the alternative is to have all their drivers never charge to 100% and to forget or ignore um, to charge them up ever to 100% and then they'll be running out of charge while their SOC, state of charge readout, is just taking wild guesses. They just play safe. It's up to you. The kinder approach is the one I described earlier. Ah, but what about NMC? Nickel, metal, metal, cobalt. They simply hate being charged to 100%. We're told never to do that. Once again, they don't exactly say never do it. It's there to be used. If you need it, use it. I got down to 3% state of charge. It's on video uh, the other day because I needed it. Once in a while, it's not going to collapse the entire battery pack or do any real serious harm. It's just not kind. 
So LFP are really poor at telling exactly where 100% is without charging there on a regular basis. But NMC are much better, but not perfect. NMC BMS can calculate can calculate range much more accurately, but it too can benefit from a top up to 100%, maybe once a year, just to reset it. It has a habit of, if it doesn't know exactly, just taking a voltage of the worst cell in the pack and, call, and using that to be safe. The only downside to this is some cells may never get a full charge, which they do actually quite like once in a while, stretching them out. It's what it's there for, but if some never get there, then your stated charge accuracy also tends to drift, just not very much on an NMC, and you will be kind to yourselves, allowing all to get up to the full potential, and you'll probably find you gain a few miles range doing this. Well, you don't actually get gain anything. It was always there, it was just that the BMS did didn't know it was there. Well, that's your lot. I've tried to keep this really simple because then you might use some of this and it really does work. It will extend the life of your battery. If I went super technical, most people just give up and wander off and just don't go and do what they think works or what their mate tells them. And that definitely can sometimes damage your battery. Either way, if you only keep your EVs two or three years, none of this will affect you. So don't worry about it, but it will possibly have an effect on those who buy your used EV after you swap it in. And most definitely will, definitely will impact those that want to use it long afterwards, uh, after it becomes impractical to use as an EV battery. Italy's Rome Airport run their lights uh, from discarded Nissan Leaf battery packs to reduce costs. Thanks for watching. I'm Dave.